Well, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker today, who it's my great honor to introduce. Dr. Udo Schuchling is the Ontario Research Chair in Bioethics at Queen's University. And relevant to the talk this evening, between 2009 and 2011, he chaired an international expert panel drafting a landmark national report on end-of-life issues on behalf of the Royal Society of Canada. His most recent books are 50 Great Myths About Atheism with Russell Blackford, Wiley, Black, uh, Wiley Blackwell 2013, and the third edition of Bioethics and Anthology with Helga Kuss. Kuss, yeah. Kuss and Peter Singer also with Wiley Blackwell. Please welcome uh, Professor Udo Schuchling on his talk, Why Legalizing Assisted Dying is a Good Idea. Wow. Well, thanks very much for coming. I must say I'm totally surprised. I quietly thought there would be 5, 10, 20 people maybe because the weather is nice, frankly, and most people probably have bigger fish to fry than thinking it's such a wonderful evening about death and dying, but, but all the more. Thank you very much and welcome. Yep. Um, so, you heard already that I, that I shared this, um, that I shared this, uh, this expert panel in, in Canada. I need to tell you that Prior to my appointment to, ch to chair to, to be the chair of this thing, um, I hadn't written anything about assisted dying or euthanasia or any of those things. So I haven't been an activist prior to writing this report. We spent two years working on this document, um, and I will tell you at some point later how you can download it free of charge if you want to actually read it. Um, one of our major recommendations um, was that Canada should consider decriminalizing assisted dying, and ever since, um, I have been pretty busy within Canada, but even beyond Canada, talking about why the decriminalization of assisted dying at this point in time probably is not a terrible idea. So I'm trying to sell you that story. I want to be really clear. I'm not pretending that this is a terribly balanced teaching exercise. I'm trying to give you my reasons for why I think um, we ought to consider at least decriminalizing assisted dying. Most of this presentation will consist of, of slides. I will talk to the slides. That might be the good news for some of you who really hate listening to speakers that read things. But there are bits and pieces where I will be reading text to you. So I'm a philosopher. Be prepared for that. All right. So um, quickly a bit of terminology. When I talk about assisted dying, Today, I only talk about cases of assisted suicide where, as assisted suicide, I understand the act of intentionally killing oneself with the help of another. Say, like in Switzerland, the doctor prescribes medication to you, but you have to be able to take it yourself and you have to be competent to make the choice that you want to take it. So this is why it's called assisted suicide. Somebody helps you to kill yourself. Voluntary euthanasia, on the, on the other hand, probably much more controversial, is an act that is undertaken by one person to kill another person, whose life is no longer worth living to them in accordance with the wishes of that person. Why is this controversial? Well, typically, we don't think highly of people who kill other people. So that's the reason. In fact, in most jurisdictions, you would describe it as murder in some, some form or shape. So obviously, if you suggest that these sorts of acts ought to be decriminalized, you have quite a mountain to climb in terms of argument that you have to present in order to defend that kind of view. As far as advanced directives are concerned, and this is mostly for the students here, if you ever write a paper on assisted dying, you almost certainly have to write about advanced directives. Advanced directives are not advanced directive, which is what students frequently use. Advanced is like a sophisticated thing. Here, advanced means it's something forward-looking. Right? So advanced directives are given are directions that are given by a competent individual concerning what and or how and or by whom decisions should be made in the event that at some times in the future the individual becomes incompetent to make health care decisions for themselves. <coughs> and this of course does not have to be anything to do with assisted dying. You might just say that you want certain foods or that you don't want to be in hospital. Um, advanced directives are a good idea. For anybody, by the way, just ask yourself whether you'll be happy if you end up in an accident tomorrow and then able to express your wishes. Um, it might just be a good idea to write these things down even at a fairly early stage in your life. Terminal sedation 
has become ever more important because for some people there has become an alternative really to to euthanasia. What you do when you when you when you talk about terminal sedation and also funny enough the legal status of this is unclear in most countries. Um, terminal sedation is when you have potentially life-shortening deep and continuous sedation that is intentionally combined with the cessation of nutrition and hydration. So there could be somebody who wrote an advanced directive and basically said, if I ever turn unconscious, I do not want you to provide me with, uh, with food, basically, and, and water. At the same time, you might be able to get a doctor to prescribe what is called terminal sedation. Terminal sedation means some, you are sedated to such an extent that you are unable to even ask for nutrition. You basically have switched off. When you combine these two things, then death is inevitable. See. So this is why terminal sedation has become important and, and is important in the context of assisted dying. So I admitted earlier that this report is a Canadian report. Um, but the points that you find here about the Canadian experience at the end of life is not dissimilar to what you would find in this country. And where there are differences, I will flag them to you. Um, it turns out to be the case that most of us would like to die at home. And it's also true that most of us do not actually die at home. Most of us think that we should have an advanced directive, that it would be really a good idea, except most of us have no advanced directive in place. And that includes me. Most of us think that we should talk to our loved ones about our end of life. It turns out only about every second of us actually does that. I don't know, have you done that? Ask yourself. Um, does your partner know exactly what your wishes are? Okay, some people are nodding. I um, suspect the younger folks who have never thought about that possibility that you should talk to your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband, wife, whatever it might be. Most of us also think that we should talk to our family doctor or a GP about our end of life, but only about 9% of us actually do that. 95, and this is now a Canadian figure, and I do not wish to, to, to extend it to the United States because I don't know what the situation in your country is. 95% of deaths in Canada would actually benefit from palliative care, yet about 70% of Canadians do at this point in time not have access that is reliable. That is to say, you can get really first-class palliative care in Canada, but you will not be able to access this right when you need it. So it's not enough to say, we have all these great facilities in place, and it turns out that people can't access them when they should need them, either because, because there are resource constraints, they can only take so many people in, or they live in the wrong part of the country, and so on and so forth. Um, here's a figure that is Canadian. Um, about 50% of parents with late-stage cancer children support hastening the death of their own children. It's a very, I think it's a very significant number. A strong majority, which is about 70% of Canadians, today support the decriminalization of assisted dying. In Quebec, support for decriminalization is at 86%, so the French are always in the difference. 25% of Canadian doctors today are willing to provide assisted dying if it were legal. The reason why, in the Canadian context, this figure is important is, as you will see, um, when I give you some other figures um, a bit later, you don't need that many doctors to provide assisted dying. So you don't need 100% of doctors saying, I want to do this, or I'm willing to do this. In fact, one in four doctors, it's a huge number of doctors that are prepared to do this without today knowing what regulations or legislation might, might be put in place in, in the country. The College of Physicians in Quebec has report, uh, a report has argued that if euthanasia is introduced, it should be considered in the context of medical care. This is also what we proposed in our report. And you can have an argument about this, because the truth is, you can bump someone off without being a doctor. You don't need a doctor for that. So the, the reason why we thought it would be a good idea to do this in the context of medical care is because doctors, probably like lawyers, are the most tightly regulated profession in the universe that gives you a hell of a lot of safety and security. This is why we thought that would be a good idea. Others have proposed, in fact, one of my colleagues in the, in the policy studies at Queen's University, uh, she strongly believes that doctors should not be involved, and in fact, we should have a separate profession of doctors, uh, not of doctors, but of kind of healthcare professionals that provide assisted dying in the country, and they're sort of separately regulated and, and, and whatnot. Um, in Quebec, I don't know whether you heard about it, but in Quebec, um, there's, cross, there's a cross-party consensus in their province that they want to decriminalize assisted dying. Um, the, the last attempt 
had gave this pass in Parliament failed because they had a change of government, but the new government that was just elected has promised to reintroduce that legislation. So we will see how this will pan out in Canada. I don't want to spend too much time talking about Canada, obviously. So I want to give you something really interesting. Um, and that talks to the language that we use to describe certain things. So I'll give you two slides. The first is a slide that is support in the United States for doctor-assisted suicide. And important, the reason why I put it in inverted commas is because this was the terminology used to ask a representative sample of, 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 um, of Americans. So it turns out 51% of you thought that should be the case, and 45% um, thought that should not be the case. Now I give you another slide, and I give you a completely different, different outcome. U.S. support for ending a patient's life, sorry, by ending a patient's life by some painless means. That's still says they're dying, obviously. So there you have suddenly 70% that are in favor of this, for the same thing, essentially, right? And you have 27% of, of Americans being opposed to it. So depending on the language that you use to describe the same act, you can trigger remarkably different outcomes. And you might want to keep that in mind, except to say that even if you use the language that typically opponents of assisted dying would use, like uh, um, uh, suicide, for instance, because it sounds bad to people, even there you have a majority, but it's a small majority, about 51%. In Canada, the situation is, is not dissimilar. In Canada, the situation is that in surveys undertaken by organizations opposed to assisted dying, like pro-life organizations, even in their, by their own, in their own survey, they ended up in a situation that 60% of Canadians still were in favor of decriminalization of assisted dying, um, using the language, uh, the be their best effort at getting a no to that. So you might want to keep that in mind. Um, this is not just a fluke. That's what I'm trying to get at. And this is, I think, why this matters in liberal democracy. Now, why do we want that anyway? What are our reasons for that? Um, it turns out the reasons are actually really complex. It's fundamentally actually a desire to control the circumstances of our death, more so than concerns about pain and suffering, even though that is also important. Um, it is a fear of loss of independence and inability to care for ourselves. It's a fear of cognitive impairment. It's worries about future pain, and the worry, generally speaking, about the poor quality of life. So our motives really arise from a complex combination of physical, psychosocial, and existential suffering and that, of course, is a type of suffering that has objective as well as subjective elements. Why does it matter? It matters because opponents of assisted dying will always come back with one retort that you will always hear. This one retort is, we should just improve palliative care because if we organize the pain management in such a way that people don't feel pain and they're not concerned about their pain, they will not request assisted dying. And this is true and it's also false. What is true is that the better the provision of palliative care is, the lower the number of people who ask for assisted dying. It is also the case that regardless of how good palliative, the provision of palliative care is, there is still a significant number of people that would rather be dead and don't like the idea, for instance, of being switched off by, uh, by, by medication and, and just basically vegetate until they finally die in natural death, death of sorts. So I want to... <coughs> Make this a bit more personal. Um, I don't know how many of you know the, um, the novelist um, Terry Pratchett. I don't know whether this rings a bell at all. Um, he himself is considering oops, something is happening here that shouldn't happen. Okay, this is gone. And I just want to give you like a video. Actually, you know what? I can probably, while we wait for the guy to come back, I can probably. Oh, is it really? No, actually, it's... Oh, yeah, okay. Because I tied it... Yeah, you see, I'm a philosopher. You can tell I really need to screw this probably together. Um, all right, so let's try this again then. Um, and let's continue with the current slide. Okay. So, Terry Pratchett is considering um, assisted dying himself, but here what he's doing is he's interviewing a guy by the, name, by the name of Andrew Colgan. And this is not, not an act what I'm giving to you. Now, Andrew Colgan is dead at this point in time. Um, he explains 
why he is traveling to Switzerland to ultimately commit suicide by means of, by means of assistance that is provided by, by Dignitas in that, in that country. And I want to... Um, there we go. It will be Andrew, I expect. Sorry, Andrew. Okay, sir. Sorry, it's not thing you kind of expect, Terry, but actually just wondered if you were in room. So. How old are you, Andrew? 47. When did you get the MS? Isn't it? Yes. Um, I, I started to have tiny symptoms going back to the 90s, but I was actually diagnosed in 2003. Most mornings I get out of the bed by falling out of the bed, and then I'll have to crawl from room to room when I'm bad. All I've got to look forward to now is things getting worse. It's like walking down a, an alley that's getting narrower, with no doors, it's so sort of Less place to move around. Yeah. I can't and I don't want to live the life I've got now. What other things have you considered? I have tried and I seem fairly indestructible on that point. But you have tried to kill yourself, yes? Yes. How many times? Ah, uh, too much. How? Right. Once, once was like two, three months worth of morphine tablets, and that should have flattened an elephant initially, but apparently no, all I did is knock myself out for five days, so I kind of opened my eyes, and the very first thing that flashed across my mind was over. Just a lot of frustration comes to the point where I'm going to have to rely on somebody else to pay somebody else to do it for me, and do it properly. I would like to have a death which is comfortable, relatively painless, and I'm really of the opinion that why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't he? Believe it or not, I have only two slides ethical reasons in favour of decriminalisation, and I will spend the rest of the, this talk looking at counter arguments. Because I think the counter arguments are the more interesting, but the rest is fairly easy to establish why we, why we should be able to do this sort of thing. And that is so because in liberal societies, we need really very powerful reasons to prevent legally competent adults from living their lives as they see fit, especially when it comes to actions that are fundamentally self regarding, provided they are both informed and the choices that are made are not coerced. And this has to do with our respect for autonomous choices. And autonomy really goes back to this, this Greek word, right? It's autos, self, and nomos, rule. So it's self-rule. So in a way, our individual self-rule eventually also gave birth to our democratic society. So we still rule ourselves, but in the same sense, we're also entitled to rule whatever happens to our own bodies and to ourselves. And then, of course, crucial in the context of life and death questions. It's also fundamental, at least in Canada, to our common law tradition. There are constitutional limits, and I will talk to those. Public safety in Canada, order, health. There's this funny thing, morals, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others, which all makes much sense, of course. So it turns out, precisely for that reason, suicide is not illegal in Canada. Anyone who's of competent mind, and who has made up his or her mind that their life is not worth living any longer, and who intends this over time, I think, has a moral right to be respected in their choices. In Canada, in fact, you are legally entitled um, to stop treatment, even life-sustaining treatment. You cannot be forced against your wishes, for instance, to be treated in hospital. So to my mind, we should not criminalize professionals that are aiming to assist those of us who have made such a difficult choice. And equally, of course, we shouldn't force anyone to assist those who have made such a difficult choice either. And this goes to the, uh, the, the conscientious objection um, provisions that we have in Canada. I spent a bit more time, actually a significant amount of time, talking about slippery slope arguments. Um, are there any philosophers in the room? You have to suffer through this stuff now, because you have heard how we teach it. Um, because the thing is this, even if we decide, as I mean, as I try to, I, I promised I would try to sell you the story that um, 
we should decriminalize assisted dying. So the morality of assisted dying doesn't actually settle the question of whether it should be decriminalized. Because there could be reasons, for instance, that could block the passage from morality to legality. And this has to do with the concern that while it's possible to isolate precise conditions under which assisted dying might be morally justifiable, it could be difficult or impossible to design institutional mechanisms overseeing this decriminalized practice that would cleave precisely to those conditions. The fear essentially is that assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia will occur in circumstances that fall outside the morally acceptable range. For example, there could be a fear that assist assisted dying will be administered to less than fully competent patients. Or a fear might be that the practice of assisted dying assisting those who voluntarily choose to die, might give rise eventually to a situation in which people who fail to satisfy the voluntarist condition are put to death, possibly even against their wishes. Remember, they said in, um, in Nazi Germany. In other words, some people may fear that decriminalizing morally permissible cases of assisted suicide and euthanasia will create some kind of slippery slope that could lead to the practice being absurd, abused, absurd, abused, and to assisted dying occurring in more impermissible circumstances. And this is what you describe as slippery slopes, and there's different types of slippery slope arguments. Arguments involving slippery slopes are amongst the most ubiquitous in debates about assisted suicide and euthanasia. Arguments concerning um, dignity, this is the other thing that I'll be looking at today, try to show that assisted suicide and euthanasia are wrong in and of themselves and depending on the consequences that they might have. So slippery slope arguments tacitly concede that certain cases of assisted suicide uh, or euthanasia are in fact more impermissible, but they cast doubt on our ability to institutionalize them without producing catastrophic consequences. Murder of vulnerable people, for instance, those sorts of things. Uh, threats to, to um, disabled people. Slippery slope arguments, as I mentioned, are ubiquitous in public debate. In fact, hardly a day goes by without some radio talk show pundit intent upon convincing listeners that a policy he or she opposes should not be adopted, argues that if we follow the policy in question, that another far more noxious one will, will invariably follow in its train. <coughs> Academics argue about our controversial moral and policy issues, in fact, are not immune to the burden of such arguments. For example, opponents of genetic testing and screening say that there is no way to control slippery slope from therapeutic uses of these new technologies to eugenic ones. Similarly, Opponents of assisted suicide argue that the decriminalization of this practice will elicit a slide into involuntary euthanasia. So, the ubiquity of such arguments, especially amongst academics, is surprising. And the reason for this is that in almost all cases, there are logically valid arguments. When slippery slope arguments are invoked, it's almost always to change the subject. Rather than providing grounds for thinking that a proposed policy or principle is morally unacceptable, these arguments trade with the widely acknowledged inappropriateness of some other policy in principle and then tie the matter, the matter under discussion with the acknowledged problem of the latter. And these arguments do so by drawing some empirical or causal connections between the two. But as what I would do now, try to, what I try to show you now is these connections are almost always impossible to vindicate. So literature on the logic of argumentation distinguishes two basic forms of slippery slope arguments. Both types are present in the assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia debate. Some slippery slopes are conceptual. They claim that the concepts that are used to set up criteria governing a practice are fuzzy, and that this conceptual vagueness will lead to the practice being abused. Others are causal. They claim that if a certain decision or policy is implemented that could in and of itself be morally acceptable, Claim that if a certain decision or policy is implemented that could in and of itself be morally acceptable, causal mechanisms will be put in place that will unavoidably lead to the making of other, much more morally dubious decisions. So, to give you an example of the, the first type of argument, look at the, um, look at the um, criteria that are given in Quebec's bill that proposes to decriminalize assisted dying. And you can see on the slide here that some things. Um, in, in, in bold font. You need, to, you need to suffer from a curable serious illness. Now, 
people would say, this is very fuzzy. What is an incurable serious illness? Is it diabetes? Is it me with my permanently shaking hands? Um, which is a neurology condition, by the way. Um, you must also suffer from an advanced state of irreversible decline in capability. Now, what exactly, the conceptual objectors would say, is an advanced state of irreversible decline? Where does it end? We get on a slippery slope there if we do that. And a bit further down, the patient must make a decision in a free and informed manner. Now, anybody who knows that there is no such a thing as a completely free anything, you will always be influenced by certain things. So depending on how you define free choice, you could have a nervous slippery slope argument coming your way. So, so what's the problem here, basically? The problem, of course, is something that we call the Soritis Paradox, right? Um, and here, just to, be, just to give an example for instance, to use, I talked about you know, the, um, the competency issue. So Soritis Paradox goes like this then. For every competent person, there will be one who is just slightly less competent, where the difference between the two hardly seems significant enough to ground the claim that one is competent whereas the other is not. But then there will be a person just slightly less competent than the second, and then another just slightly less competent than the third, and so on and so forth, and very quickly, so goes the slippery slope argument, um, you will end up in a situation where medical assisted dying is being practiced on patients, on patients, from very difficult, would be very difficult indeed to claim that they're competent at all. So frequently then, the specter of the Nazi murders, of course, of intellectually disabled people is involved in order to indicate where this kind of slippery slope would lead any society that criminalizes us to die in some form or shape. Now frankly, the conceptual slippery slope argument, I think, against assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia actually points to real problems. But it's a problem that is ubiquitous across a full range of areas in which public policy and laws are enacted. Seeing as a reason to rescind from enacting such laws and policies would lead ultimately to stasis. Consider a much, much less dramatic area of policy, such as the determination of the age at which individuals can obtain a driver's license. There is no broad conceptual line here that separates the competence and reliability of a person of 15 years and 364 days and a person of 16 years. The gain in competency from one day to the next is really tiniest, plus and non -existent. Now since it's not acceptable as a matter of policy not to grant people driver's licenses because of our inability to determine these kinds of thresholds of competence with precision, the law simply establishes a line that is to some degree arbitrary and one should admit that. By fixing the minimum age requirement at 16, society tends to do as well as possible in ensuring that only competent people get on the road, accepting a certain number of false negatives and false positives as an acceptable cost for allowing people to be able to drive. So the exponent of the slippery slope argument against assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia will actually disagree with analogizing these cases of public policy. Because whereas the former are amenable to cost-benefit reasoning, the latter he or she will claim are not. So the argument might, might run like this. When the placing of an arbitrary line at one point rather than another along the continuum risks placing the defense of a principle on the wrong side of the line, we should avoid, avoid drawing that line at all and proceed from, from the uh, uh, practice that has been criticized. And this, of course, is a moral problem, no matter what the benefit of drawing the line somewhere is. So for example, if it is settled, that say a stringent test X accommodates a request for assisted dying, and then there exists a more stringent test X plus one. The space between X and X plus one can be cached out in terms of life lost that ought not to have been lost. So the more stringent test there it should be chosen, namely outright, they would argue, or almost outright prohibition. That's the logic of the slippery slope argument. Now this line of reasoning, I think, can be resisted in a number of ways. First, and really very importantly, prohibition will not lead to the elimination of lives lost through assisted dying. It will rather mean that the practice will continue as it does today in all jurisdictions where it is prohibited in the absence of any principle or institutional safeguard. Secondly, the moral cost of not acting must be reckoned that flow from permission and from prohibition. 
So the moral costs of the latter are needless suffering and forging the wills of autonomous individuals. The exponent of this liberal slope argument against euthanasia is that suicide cannot, in other words, in other words, avoid assessing the cost of not drawing a line somewhere. And finally, the valence of concepts can only be limited of limited use to the partisan of liberal slope arguments. For, for though a concept like that of competence is ambiguous, it cannot be reasonably inferred that there are not clear paradigmatic cases of competence, and correspondingly, that there are not some paradigm cases of incompetence. So the fallacy then of the Sarritis paradox upon which this conceptual slippery slope is grounded claims there will come a point when the succession of imperceptibles gives rise to cases in which it is known that it is no longer competent individuals that have been dead. Now, causal slippery slopes, of course, are based on empirical premises, and they are not then a neurotological refutation. Unless their empirical premises run counter to the laws of physics, they involve real possibilities. So it, rather, it is then rather that human decisions will give rise to other human decisions, and that whereas the first set of decisions were more acceptable, the second set of decisions, unavoidable according to the slippery slope theorist, once the first have been made, are clearly unacceptable. The, inevi the, inevi the inevitability of the second set of decisions is seen in this way to basically become the first. So, the causal mechanisms invoked to make such arguments plausible are of a very different kind from those involved in straightforward consequential reasoning. The argument based on such mechanisms is, I think, much more difficult to make good because these arguments imply that such mechanisms will not sway even when the possibilities are laid bare and steps are taken to counteract them. So, consider two cases. The first is one in which a person has no more qualms about the principles and decisions which may flow from an initial decision. She thinks that they are both morally justified. When she adopts the second, it's not as a result of having fallen prey to the slippery slope. Rather, she simply expresses her support for both decision one and decision two, for whatever principles under, underpin the two decisions. In the second, though, an agent supports decision one, but has serious moral concerns about decision two. He's aware of the fact that there are empirical, say, psychological, social, institutional, and so on and so forth, mechanisms that make it more likely that decision two will come to seem more plausible to some once decision one has been taken. So that's the causality here. This person is aware of the risk of slippery slope, but the intent as he is to resist it, really it pains to put safeguards in place, and this is what we will do today, right? To make it as likely that it might otherwise have been that policy or decision two will come to be adopted as a result of policy or decision one having been adopted. So, my reply, in other words, to the, to the argument about um, the, the, the causes of the slope argument is essentially to do what is being done in all jurisdictions that have to criminalize it, put safeguards in place, lots of them. And I will give you later on some data that to my mind show that these slippery slope arguments are not supported in the real world in those uh, jurisdictions that have decriminalized, including uh, a bunch of uh, um, states in, in the United States now. I will do, very quickly now, talk about question banking stuff that you also hear in this context. I had the pleasure just, just literally um, last week um, to debate a guy who you might know, Gilbert Mylander. He's, uh, he was on President Bush's Council on Bioethics. And we had an argument that's much nicer than what I'm doing here today. We had an argument about infanticide of severely impaired newborns. And I'm not doing this here because I want to go home later. So, so he responded then to people saying, well, this might be good idea for some severely impaired newborns. And he said, would you like to live in a society that kills its most vulnerable? And he claimed that it violates human dignity. And I want to address these two things. First of all, I want to talk, uh, sorry, let me just first do the, the first one straight away. Would you like to live in a society that kills the most vulnerable? The answer to that is, if you're really compassionate, there might be circumstances. So you can answer that question in the affirmative. So you have to be really careful when somebody asks you rhetorical questions and you give the wrong answer. Because that's what I did. The, the second thing about human dignity, though, and we have written much more about this in our, in our report, um, I want to start quickly, at least, to, to start with a, with a quote by David Hyman. Um, he wrote, 
In every generation, philosophers, ethicists, religious figures, politicians, and professional warrior wards, it's a nice word, have cited human dignity as a reason to restrict innovation or prohibit outright. Consider a few examples. Galileo was forced to recant his heinous head of abuse because of the Roman Catholic Church had already embraced the Ptolemaic um, system as more consistent with biblical revelation of man's dignity as God's creation. Indoor plumbing, the printing press, skyscrapers, the suburbs, automobiles, television, the younger people in this room will not know what this is, but the Sony Walkman, and the franchise for women were all met with the objection that they were inconsistent with human dignity. So the Industrial Revolution, which laid the foundations for the modern world, was criticized because machines were expected to also destroy human dignity. And if you were to ask, if, if I were to ask you, would you like to be treated with dignity? There is nobody going to object here. The funny thing is, you all have very different ideas what that means. And this takes us to the crux, or the crux, crux, crux of human dignity. It's, it's a thing that is completely in the eyes of the beholder. That's the reality. So, to give you an example, the Canadian Supreme Court, um, 10, 15 years ago, I think, um, decided on the, on the assisted dying issue. And on both sides, it was a 5 to 4 decision, keeping it criminalized. Those who want to keep it criminalized used the human dignity trope, and those who wanted to decriminalize it and do away with the, the criminal prohibition also used the human dignity trope. And when you carefully think about it, you will discover that the Roman Catholic Church, for instance, when they are campaigning against uh, um, assisted dying, they will always talk about how this violates human dignity. And then, of course, there's dying with dignity. So basically, dignity is a free for all. This is what, what I would just like you to keep in mind. And what it really does is it cloaks controversial moral considerations in the pleasing language of human dignity. That's, that's the kicker, right? There's nothing itself to human dignity. When you look at the the history of, of the term, you will discover it has been literally all over the place. If you go to Afghanistan and you ask an Al-Qaeda um, activist what they think human dignity entails for women, they will tell you a very different story to what you think what human dignity should entail as far as your treatment is concerned. So, so there is no fact of the matter, if you know what I mean, with regard to what human dignity actually entails. There's no trump where you could say, this is what it really means. Very important. So my view is we would be better off stopping to use dignity rhetoric and present instead the values that lie behind dignity and just be frank about what we mean and why we have certain views that we hold. So just quickly, we have a bunch of jurisdictions that permit assisted dying. The Netherlands is allowing voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide. Uh, Central Belgium, Central Luxembourg, Switzerland, assisted suicide. In the United States, uh, in Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Vermont, you have um, assisted suicide. Um, I don't know what the situation in Mexico is at the moment, I think it's in the courts there, but this will also be assisted suicide. What are the consequences of decriminalization in these jurisdictions that have decriminalized? First, it does not undermine the healthcare professional patient relationship. We have a lot of empirical evidence now from places like Belgium and the Netherlands, for instance looking at the question of what the impact of the availability of assisted dying in those jurisdictions had on the doctor-patient relationship. And it turns out it has not undermined it at all. Patients are just as comfortable to go to their doctors and they're not worried that they might be bound off. There's also an evidence in support of slippery slope claims, and this again speaks, in Canada at least, to the constitutional safety concern. In Belgium, since decriminalization, illegal and unprosecuted practices went down from 4.3% prior to decriminalization 2.7% today. And this is where we have to be, when somebody comes with these kinds of slippery slope arguments, what they do really, they will, they will point to you a particular egregious case in their view that happened in Belgium. Uh, you might remember these two brothers that were euthanized. Um, they were blind already and they were turning deaf and they couldn't see how they could continue living and they, they were euthanized on their request. And they would say, you see, once you start this, this is where this ends. These vulnerable people will get killed. And the thing is, A, you don't know whether this is a result of decriminalization because it may have happened anyway. Because when you look at um, this figure that I'm just giving you here, you can see that prior to decriminalization, assisted dying occurred anyway. So it's not clear that anything that happens in Belgium today is a of illegal practices is a result of decriminalization. There's also an evidence in support of claims that 
vulnerable, vulnerable people would be um, at particular risk of abuse. It turns out the average person that is requesting assistance in dying is a 60 to 85 year old, well educated, middle class cancer patient that gives me another 10 years if I get cancer. There is no apparent disproportionate use of assisted dying in the Netherlands and vulnerable populations. There is a whole bunch of studies all coming to the same conclusion on this issue. We also know that palliative care does not suffer as a consequence of the introduction of assisted dying. It's another slippery slope argument, which is if we allow the state to bump off people, why bother with palliative care? They will probably cut it back, and palliative care will, will, will suffer as a result of decriminalization. That also hasn't happened. It turns out that, and I quote from, from a, a major report in the, in, 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 was from the Lancet in, in the Netherlands, physicians, quote, do not substitute hastening death for the provision of palliative care, unquote. It's also the case that healthcare professionals who were initially concerned are today overwhelmingly not worried any longer why assisted dying wants us to criminalize. In the Netherlands, for instance, 84% of doctors support assisted dying. There's strong societal support for decriminalization in those countries. The percentage of assisted deaths in those societies ranges from 0.1%, which I think is, is, um, is Oregon, <coughs> to about 3%, which is Belgium today. And remains relatively stable over time. What I mean with relatively stable, you sometimes you some you sometimes see that you know from one year to the next, you might have you know 0 0.3, 0.5 percent. It's going up and down. Um, that's not an indication of a slippery slope. If you were to expect that there's some massive slippery slope going on, you would expect that these numbers increase significantly, and that the people at the receiving end of the slippery slope would be people like disabled people that you're concerned about. Um, they are, are the homeless people, impoverished people, you try to save healthcare costs. You would expect these sorts of people to pop up in those statistics in very significant numbers, and none of that is happening in none of the jurisdictions that I have um, that I've just been talking about. So this is why the slippery slope arguments I think are really important that we need to look very carefully at, at what they're telling us actually. Um, you also, I think, need to be careful about another kind of slippery slope arguments where you will find people saying, well, last year, I don't know, for the sake of the argument, last year in Belgium, there were 3,000 people that were euthanized on their request. And this year it's 5,000. Now let me ask you something. If you offer a free public service, and that service is used by people, do you believe that's a killer argument when you have an increase in that utilization? A killer argument indicating abuse. It simply means, on the face of it, that a service is being used nothing else. So you cannot go really above and say, look at this, these numbers are increasing. For crying out loud, if you provide this sort of service, you would expect people to use it, and you would expect these numbers to increase. The reality is they're not increasing dramatically. Um, so I have been, I must say, I've been really puzzled about, about the logic of this, of this argument altogether. <clears throat> I do this really very quickly, I just want to check, no, actually, I should skip this altogether, I think. I should not bore you with the details of our, our Canadian things. Suffice it to say, as is the dying in Canada, since the Supreme Court, two things are going to happen. First, the Supreme Court will decide whether assisted dying, uh, whether the criminalization of assisted dying in Canada violates the, uh, the constitutional rights of Canadians. Um, the other thing that's going to happen, which is really interesting, is that Quebec will decriminalize assisted dying sometime this year. Not decriminalize it, they can't decriminalize it because the criminal code is federal. But what they will do is they will declare it healthcare. They will simply say the provision of euthanasia and assisted suicide is part of healthcare. Healthcare in Canada is provincial. So this will also go to the Supreme Court. Why will it go to the Supreme Court? Because they will have to decide whether something that they consider healthcare also violates the federal criminal code, and they have to decide who ultimately wins. Because if the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, for instance, could decide that this really is healthcare and it is provincial, and if that entails this sort of thing, it's not a violation of the, of the, of the, um, the federal criminal code. In the end, how this will pan out, I have no idea. I want to briefly at least, and this is a really tricky one for a guy who is a skinhead and has a German accent. Um, discrimination against the disabled. There is uh, an, an activist group in, uh, in Canada, you might have heard too, 
um, a disability rights activist group called Not Dead Yet. And their primary thing is really to campaign against euthanasia. And this is a really awkward situation because I have been once in a panel, on a, on, in a panel discussion with, 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 with one of these activists, you know, who could barely walk, of course, and got herself up there and basically said he's the murderer. Um, the problem with this is, it is perfectly understandable, considering the history, for instance, of what happened in Nazi Germany, that these people are greatly concerned about their safety and security. But from a public policy perspective, it is absolutely crucial to understand that all the data that we have from any of the jurisdictions that have decriminalized so far do not support this proposition. It's really the kinds of people that you would find hanging out in these sorts of places. They're in their 60s, they are, they are dying of cancer, and they think, you know what, I've, I've had enough, I, I don't think I will go through this. This is the typical person that is asking for this. It is not the typical person that is uh, suffers from a serious disability. You can have an argument, in fact, whether this is a problem. It's a problem in terms of access. Does it really mean that when you look at these jurisdictions and the only people that avail themselves are really middle and upper class, highly educated people, you have a totally different kind of problem, as far as I'm concerned, than the problem that these activists are concerned. What I wanted to to flag to you briefly at least, and which is good and bad, let's put it this way. Um, the nature of the debate about assisted dying has really changed rapidly over the last 10, 10 or 15 years. The, the protagonists are the same. But basically we have moved on from religious to public reasoning. So very few people in, in our parts of the world, I don't want to talk about your country, um, in our parts of the world, there's very few religious activists that would go out there and say, my God believes, you know, you should not have this right, and therefore we must not legislate and, and praise, praise the Lord. And that's the end of it. Because there would be laughter in the room. So that's not happening any longer. The same activists, of course, are still around, and I think that's probably legitimate in liberal democracy. You, you campaign for your, for your policy objectives. But the language that they are using today is the language that I have, this is why I spent so much time talking about these things. They're talking about the vulnerable people who are being bumped off because they discover they have also funding from the Catholic Church in Canada, for instance. So they spend lots of time doing pilot studies. And they discover if they drum up concerns about vulnerable people being murdered, disabled people, that sells because anybody who has any empathy at all would be concerned about that possibility of abuse. So, so this is a campaign stream that they have, the vulnerability argument. They're also telling us that palliative care will totally go down the drain. And they run super slow arguments non-stop. This is why I probably bored you to death with uh, uh, reading that part of our report to you. But I think it's really important because this is what this whole debate will boil down to. I think even Canada, the Supreme Court decision, will boil down to make a judgment on the question of whether there is a serious risk um, to all sorts of people, and whether it's a slippery slope of any of these two kinds that I mentioned. And last but not least, I'm not kidding you, they manufacture evidence. Um, they go so far, there's a guy in, in, in Ottawa, a very religious palliative care specialist, he wrote a journal article where he made claims that palliative care will be eliminated and, and all sorts of things. And then all these proper medical references and was published in a journal called <coughs> uh, Current Oncology. And then somebody actually went through the effort to look at all his references, and it turned out that the references actually do not support the claims made in that paper. Now here's the kicker. He wrote it literally a few weeks before the court was starting to debate the matter in British Columbia. So it was designed to influence a particular court decision. By the time you would find out that this was a fraudulent article, this is all down the drain and the verdict has been reached. So, so this, this, this is basically what, what, this is what I'm trying to, to get to you, is how this debate has become less religious, but still very politicized. Um, I want to, I'm just about finished by the way, which is probably a good thing for some of you. Um, I wanted to give you Andrew Colgan's mother. It's very interesting because she does not agree with her son's decision. The reason why I think this is important because we got to ask ourselves whether our own disapproval of euthanasia is a good reason to legislate against it. 
In other words, I would never do this, therefore nobody else must do this. And this is why I think her views on this matter are really, um, are really important, because she does not agree with her son at all. His mother was not very keen on his proposed journey to Switzerland. I was surprised, therefore, when I met her. So we're here with him to support him. So as a mother, it's for Amanda to swing like this next week. Should I have torn up the passports? You know, anything in desperation to keep him. But it's selfish. It is a selfish and not a loving thing to do. I don't think like Andrew thinks on this one. You know, I always think tomorrow is another day. It's just so stressful again and so hurtful for us all to have to be in a country that mm -hmm. isn't home. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have to go home tomorrow without my son. And I shall in due course without me get some ashes to it. We'll just have to get through it because we can't bear to think of him lying in bed and in some of the conditions we know he could possibly end up in. It took me a long, long while to realise that the quality of life that he has now is not acceptable. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, it is their decision, and I think it's their right. I've probably done more good with that speech than I have for all time. Well, it's exactly what it was, what it felt. It is what it felt. What I think we should we should really keep in mind in these debates is that if we do not decriminalize and we keep the status quo, that is not a costly relativity. By virtue of this act of omission, and it is an act, it condemns many of us towards the end of our lives to unnecessary stress and suffering. And this is a cost that occurs daily, that we are incurring right now daily in all the jurisdictions that have not decriminalized this for time. And we've got to balance that really against any real, or what I think are mostly, imagined risks associated with the decriminalization of assisted dying. Okay, thank you very much, Mama. If you wanted to, to read the report, the Royal Society of Canada report on this issue, you can download it. It's an open access document, so it's a university here, so it's easy for you to do. Uh, you can find it on the website of the Journal of Bioethics. Um, you just go literally, like you Google the Journal of Bioethics, and you will go to the, the front page of the journal, and there's a thing called the Royal Society Report or whatever. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open access PDF, so you can read the whole thing there, and, and, um, and then we can forward to our discussion. So thanks again. You can actually just Google Professor Shirkling's last name and expert panel, and that's okay. the first thing that shows up. Students have been asking for it. So oh, well. Wow. You're okay, now you don't need a break. I still have to be in charge, not me. Alright, well let's uh, let's go straight into some questions here. I'd like to ask the first, if that's okay, and I'll, I'll pass it on. Uh, you of course talked about voluntary and involuntary, but I don't think you talked about it in any great detail and I'm passing over briefly when talking about slippery slopes. Uh, Non-voluntary euthanasia, when someone's unable to consent, but we perhaps feel that we ought to terminate their life. I was hoping you might comment on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the, the argument that we proposed in, um, in our report was an argument informed by constitutional Canadian values. And in Canada, respect for individual autonomy is one of the most important values that drives, that drives the, char the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So I haven't talked about involuntary euthanasia, I haven't talked about incompetent people. Um, the case that I've made here really only extends to people that are capable of making that choice when they want assisted dying. Like, like Andrew Colvin, for instance, would be a good example. Um, it would not include people that have always been incompetent. It would not include the severely impaired newborns that I've just talked about. They might only have like a week or two or three weeks um, until they finally um, expire, whether they should be euthanized in order to, to alleviate their pain and suffering none of those cases. So this really is a case uh, for the decriminalization of assisted dying for people that are competent. And, and everything else is a different argument to be had, but, but it would not be good to have it today because I deliberately did not talk about any of those things. 
thank you so very much. Um, my question actually kind of picks up on the idea of autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a couple of things. In the PowerPoint, you talked about there are certain cases where we restrict individuals' autonomy. Um, for the cases of law and order and society and such, we voluntarily cede some of our claims to autonomy. Right there. Yes. And then picking up on what the mom said right at the very end about you know, this is a very selfish decision. Um, is there a case for for arguing that even if this is the individual person's <coughs> choice, the consequences on the family, the surrounding, the practice, you know, this choice affects more than just the individual person. Is is autonomy really that strong to overwhelm those other considerations? Mm -hmm. I think you're asking a fair enough question because the reality is, as you have seen, this mother is suffering tremendously. Um, you might remember this this case I think uh, that happened here, where this um, elderly man dragged his uh, um, recently um, disabled wife in front of the train, and, they committed, and he committed suicide, and she had no idea what was happening probably, and was murdered arguably um, at the time. With good attention, but not as murdered, right? Um, and the son was devastated. He said, I have no idea whether the mother would have wanted that. Um, the long and short of it is still, I think, it would be very difficult to run an argument that says, you must live because somebody else disagrees with that, even if that somebody else is a loved one. Um, yeah, because, you, I mean, you could run a utilitarian argument to be fair doing that, right? But an autonomy argument is very tricky to say that because, partly because suicide is already legal in this jurisdiction. So people can bump themselves off anyway. The, the, the view is not held, as far as the, the, the Constitution is concerned, that you have that sort of obligation. Otherwise, um, you would really, in the end, run an argument that you must live because someone else disagrees with you. I personally find that problematic, but it would be an argument that one could have. Thank you. Uh, out of curiosity, do you think that people must live in order to avoid others from being suffering as a result of them terminating their lives? I don't I lost my father to uh -huh. suicide uh -huh. and have been deeply scarred by it. Of course. You know, he he very clearly didn't think about that and I've mm -hmm. I've struggled with a lot of the consequences. I mm -hmm. I honestly can't say I know, but mm -hmm. I'm not quite okay to say sure. just because it's their decision that that makes it okay for everything the rest of us have to go through. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want you to clarify something because that presentation is so much. So I just want to know if that presentation is saying that you believe most people with severe illness and also those people who are normal but pushing to die because they feel that their love is suffering, they, uh, both of them are allowed to use uh, euthanasia? I do think so. And I have and this I uh, question that I take philosophy in high school, but all the lesson, it seems like they encouraging people to live on even though their life is suffering. It's like they just are uh, showing this um, inspiring quote to, keep, to inspire you to keep living on, but since um, we're talking about this, it seems like it's encouraging people to die. No. <laughs> I would never encourage anybody to die because I like my life, you have no idea. So, so, so nothing, nothing could be furthest from my mind to encourage people to, to terminate their lives. And it turns out, when you actually look at it carefully, you will find out that the decriminalization of assisted dying does not result in the large numbers of people terminating their lives. What it is for many people is a psychological security mechanism. They know that if they can't bear it any longer, there is a way out. As a result of that, arguably, people live longer do not commit suicide. Um, even at Dignitas in Switzerland, for instance, it turns out that 70 or 75 percent of people that come there and ask for assisted dying never take the medication. Because A, we are totally, we are, A, we are able to adapt to a lot of misery in our lives and we still consider it worth living. That's the first thing. And this is, yeah, sorry, this is the second thing. In fact, this is why I think 
that this is not encouraging anybody to die because you provide palliative care, uh, you provide counseling, um, you want to be sure that this is a decision that these people make as opposed to I push you to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I have two questions. One, um, first I'd like to clarify what condition Andrew Culkin had when he decided to do that. Multiple sclerosis. Okay. And the second question, and I was just curious about in Quebec when they wanted to do the um, the healthcare provision, like would they have like a certain age above which it would be allowed? Or like the kids with like Bulgarian disease or something like that and their parents and they, they both decide that they want to do that? Would that be allowed or do they, do they have to be like above 18 to actually get this? Quebec, I have to be careful, if you know better than that, correct me, but I think you have to be legally competent. I like you have to be in a, you have to be a mature age. It's not for mature minors. And, and, and again, I think the reason why this is happening is when you look at the surveys in Canada, you will find very clearly that this majority in favor of decriminalization very quickly crumbles when you try to extend it to people who are not competent, like children, for instance. Even people uh, who suffer from mental illnesses like clinical depression. People don't want to have anything to do with that. The idea is you have a terminal illness, I really find it, because that's really a fuzzy concept clinically, but, but you have a terminal illness, uh, are, of, uh, are of clear mind, are not coerced, and make that decision understanding what the consequences of the action are. They also understand what the consequences of not acting are, because they know what their condition means. So, so, so for those people, and this is where Quebec is acting, because that's pretty much in sync with what the vast majority of Canadians think about this. Nobody else. Having said that, if I could just add this, this is how the Belgians started. Um, today they have children in there. Um, in the Netherlands, they are willing to euthanize uh, severely impaired newborns. That is legal today. And you could have an argument. You can, have, you can do it two ways. You can say, you see the slippery slope. You could also, if you wanted to, interpret it as an example of societies that are comfortable with what is in place. They have seen the safeguards and they're willing to have these extensions. Like in Belgium, for instance, where children today can be euthanized on their request with parents consenting and uh, healthcare professionals. And it's a complicated, convoluted procedure with all sorts of safeguards. Um, and it turns out that about 75% of Belgians are in favor of that. Now that's a Catholic country, or overwhelmingly Catholic country. So, so I would not be surprised if over time this evolved to include other cases, and then the, the autonomy rationale will then be more problematic, obviously. But yeah, this is the nature of democracy. People can do that if they want to. So I thought it was actually going with the non voluntary discussion. Could parents decide for severely? In Quebec, they cannot. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm not familiar with the Canadian political system, nor the decision making. What troubles me from the American point of view, is that since the United States Supreme Court in Glucksburg denied a uh, fundamental right to die with dignity, and since the Supreme Court in Papua New Quill um, refused to use the Equal Protection Clause uh, to extend the right, we have turned to the political process by the states where four jurisdictions have voted by majority vote within those jurisdictions to extend the right to die with dignity. Whatever problems uh, pragmatically or practically are uh, associated with it, it became a political decision of the majority permitting uh, this, quote, act, not a right, but uh, a legislative permissible uh, decision. Uh, what troubles me is that that means, in, in essence, those people in Oregon, Montana, Vermont, uh, Montana, um, uh, the four states, four jur Washington state, the four jurisdictions have done so, have done so by a popular vote, without courts ever really deciding uh, the essence of human dignity within a constitutional concept of individual autonomy. Mm -hmm. Um, and from a, a, a perspective of democracy, it's exceedingly troubling because we're now having the majority decide whether an individual has the right to die or not with the judiciary, at least for the moment, uh, 
uh, at the national level, and I would think at the state levels as well, refusing to uh, consider uh, the constitutional consequences of not permitting people when the majority refuses to allow the individual to assert their right of, of uh, autonomy. I wish, in terms of the Canadian solution, is it going to be judicial or is it going to be political and are there ramifications? Okay, well, in Quebec, it's, uh, it's the parliament actually, right? So in Quebec, they legislated. That's important because they just were, were just re-elected. So, so the parties, literally we had an election in Quebec. Uh, I think they, the new government came in one, like one, two weeks ago, like just now basically. Um, all the parties, all the major parties in the legislature promised that they would reintroduce assisted dying legislation in Quebec. Um, so as far as democratic legitimacy is concerned, they certainly have it. Um, the other way that is at the same time um, follow through is of course with the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court is asked to investigate whether or not the provisions in the criminal code that criminalizes the dying uh, whether this is too broad, whether this is really, uh, is, whether this is not violating uh, Canadians' constitutional rights. So, so they follow both, both approaches, in fact. Um, I have to be honest, I don't even know, I've never thought about it politically. What's better about it? Partly, and this is very, I'm very promiscuous here, very opportunistic, because the majority is so overwhelming that I would be happy if there were votes on this anyway in Canada, because you do that in Ontario where I live, and you would be done and dusted within a week. Um, so, so waiting for the Supreme Court, they're really not accountable to anybody, just not your Supreme Court, they can more or less do what they want. Um, to, it's like throwing the dice, basically, you have no idea how that will pan out. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure, considering, considering that you have, in a democracy, a very strong majority, and we are talking now for the last 15 years, year after year after year, and you have politicians ignoring you basically across the country, to leave that to the court to say, well, you know, maybe I should do this. Um, so I really don't know. And at the end of the day, I'm just, I would just be happy if we got it. Just, just as a quick follow-up, yeah. what, what the end result is, is if uh, I live in a state where there is a majority, and uh, I would presume, <coughs> I would guess, most of the states have a majority who are against assisted dying. It means that only in those states where the political majority permits me to can I assert my individual autonomy. And I find that uh, a, a rather uh, disquieting concept yeah. within, a, within a constitutional system. Oh, we're, we're in the same situation, by the way. Quebec has already, was very clear that Quebecers can get it, but that would mean that I would probably have to learn French and live there for a year or two, possibly towards the end of my life, if this if this went through, um, because they just don't want that tourism. You know, people coming there to die eventually, they have to deal with all of that. So this is how they protect their own interests. Yeah, sorry. for a term or two, what medication you have to prescribe, what, what I know, pulse you have to check, whatever can go wrong, um, and they give you like a diploma or a degree, and that's a requirement for you to enter that profession. Um, can, everything can be done, of course it can be done, but it's likely, probably not, because the cost would be quite significant to run like a parallel system with training, with oversight, um, yeah, oversight, monitoring, uh, reporting, um, Pay scales, um, facilities. Um, do you want to set up uh, other than hospices? But do you want to set up like a dying facility? Um, sorry, I should not walk away from the camera. Anyway, so, um, so 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 these are all these are all issues that 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 would come up eventually. And I think 
at the end of the day, it wouldn't happen because there are cost considerations more than anything else. But otherwise, it's not possible. It's perfectly feasible to do that. Because today in Canada, we have nurses already that are able to prescribe all sorts of medication, for instance, to people that they could not prescribe 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I'm sure that will also continue. They will specialize more, and they will get more rights. And in the same way, we can do that to other people, too, provided we train them. No, this. Are you done? Oh, sorry. No, I'm, I'm not in charge. I mean, whoever. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Right. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if I understood right today, you were speaking about uh, people who are capable to do uh, actually efforts of the side for themselves. They can walk, they can speak, they are not in uh, such condition like, you know, they, they cannot make any decision. But here, uh, this guy, uh, Kogan, he would make decision that I want to die and all this. Uh, so I have a question about this. Uh, actually, I agree with this concept of euthanasia, but the only one thing that uh, I'm concerned about, about it's um, is it morally permissible and good to involve second person in this process? Because really, this this guy he said that yeah, I tried to kill myself uh, twice, but. Actually, he could he could do this by himself, and in this case, we have involved other person who is supposed to. I cannot say that it's killing, but it's, it's somehow uh, the action of this person will lead to the death of other person, which is uh, almost killing. I would say. So, is morally permissible, and what is the argument for this from you? Thank you. Well, there are several ways to approach that. The my immediate response would be makes it permissible is that it is the voluntariness on the healthcare professional's part. Because nobody is, the same with abortion for instance, nobody is coercing any healthcare professional to provide abortion. Um, not here, not in Canada. Um, so it would be a volunteer. And it would be a volunteer you would, who would have to be persuaded in every single case that this is a reasonable cause of action. So you would not find, I would bet you basically, you would not find some frivolous doctor who would say, well, you feel crappy today, okay, I'm happy to give you the medication and I sit next to you and see how you bump yourself off because assisted suicide will inject something in you because you're never to do it because you're too drunk. Um, it's exceedingly unlikely because there's all these safety mechanisms. Remember, you have to, the, the, the request has to be stable, for instance. So it's not that you go to some place and somebody kills you that, that same moment, but uh, you, you, you ask for this, then somebody investigates whether your whether you have a psychiatric condition, uh, whether you're competent, whether the wish is stable all the time, all of that. And that also gives some, I think, um, gives some security or safety to the, the healthcare professional because they're watching that all the time too. So they need to be persuaded because they can't be forced. And this is, I think, at the end of the day, what makes it justifiable. But in these particular cases, we involve other people in, in, in the issue when we, we can avoid this. I mean, these people can, uh, sh shouldn't do this in this particular case, for example, this guy. Well, the consequential is, so to me, there's no difference. <laughs> if the outcome is desirable, and I get you there by giving you medication that you take, versus I inject something in you because you are unable to do this, but otherwise the case is the same, I don't think there's a moral difference because I do not buy into the accident emissions doctrine or the doctrine of the double effect. Um, I, don't buy, I don't buy those stories. For consequences, for consequences yeah, there is no difference. Yes. For, I'm, uh, I'm a simple-minded utilitarian. Okay. I mean, for you as a philosopher, so, so that's where I'm coming from. But from, again, from, from an, an autonomous argument, the argument is simply the healthcare professional is not forced as a volunteer, even in the case that you have in mind where the person can't do it him or herself. Actually, it doesn't cost you at all. No. What's costly about injecting something in you that kills you within a minute? Do you think it's costly? There's nothing costly about that. What's costly, actually, is to keep you alive. 
so the insurance companies will be very happy. Trust me. Uh, the real concern, again, is the, is it cuts the other way around. You want to ensure that insurance companies cannot use the availability of assisted dying to pressure people into making these sorts of choices, for instance, by not providing palliative care. And this is why I've been talking about the safety mechanisms that you have to put in place. It has to be very public, very transparent, like, like, like in these other jurisdictions, to prevent that sort of thing from happening. So if anything, I would be concerned about that. So it cuts the other way around. Hi, do you think there may be any provisions to the law that would allow someone who isn't in a debilitating state to get assisted suicide? Like if they have a, maybe a like schizophrenia or something? Or do you think that based on their mental capacity they wouldn't be able to? But you're asking a clinical question of competence. If they are legally competent, they would be able to make that choice. Um, if they, for, for the sake of the argument, our report is, is very clear for instance, that somebody who suffers from clinical depressions, for the sake of the argument, is, is, is competent, legally competent, has been tested, has been evaluated by psychiatrists, and for the sake of the argument, again, all the medication that exists literally on the market has failed on that person. And that person basically said, you know what, I tried everything, but this life is not worth living. Um, we certainly were of the view that these are choices that we ought to respect. It is really, it hinges on the competency. That's all. Because in the end, whether depression drives you to consider your life not worth living, or it is some, some cancer, nobody would frivolously ask for these sorts of things. People struggle really hard because we are not kidding you, we all like living. It is surprising what kind of misery we, ex we accept for ourselves just to continue going for a while longer. You will discover that when you get older. It's ever more, ever more shoes drop. If people continue living, um, if that happened like immediately, you would probably not be able to adapt to that. So, so that's that's the lesson. But ultimately, people should be able to make those choices. And what do you think? Is that do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. Do you agree with that? Even depression. Yeah. It's very controversial. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that the, the um, decriminalizing the euthanasia will create inequality in a defective healthcare system? Like sometimes people make the choice not based on their wills, but because they have to. Like um, some guys may don't want to die at all, but they have to because they can't afford further treatment. And but if the physicians that are standards strict enough that they don't allow you to die just because you can't afford it. And they will just have go back home and raise money and cure yourself. And um, but but the fact is they can't afford it. They can't afford the further further treatments, even they are available. But they are not allowed to take the euthanasia to either. So so they will have to suffer until they die. I hope I understood you correctly. Um, um, sorry. I'm of two minds about it, you see. On the one hand, I mean, the gut response would be you wouldn't want anybody to ask for assisted dying because they can't afford access to care. That's straightforward, it should not happen. Um, if, on the other hand, that person, that person finds themselves a victim of circumstances that quite arguably could be unjust, from their perspective, it might still be the best possible outcome. That's my, I mean, my problem is basically I want to say no, this must never happen. Yeah. But, but, but at the same time, if they are able to control the circumstances, the healthcare professionals, who they're looking for help, are unable to provide them with the care that they needed because of financial constraints that the healthcare professionals do not control. That's the reality today. Then yes, you want a revolution and you want to change that healthcare system. But until that happens, this might still be the best available option, to that. Or, or, or the least evil, um, to respect those choices. And I find it very difficult. I'm very ambivalent about this, this issue. But when you think about it, 
what would be the alternative? The alternative would be no, because you can't afford access to the care that you need so that your life will become living again, so therefore you must continue living a life that is not worth living because I think this is so wrong. That doesn't seem to make sense either. So, so um, for the rich, they can die, choose to die because um, they try every end, every every um, way to, to preserve their life, but to cure, but they can't. But for the poor, you have no alternative. You can just suffer, right? I, I'm not sure whether, but like, in Canada, that would not happen. Yeah. Full stop. And about this country, that's a different argument that you need to have here, I guess. I don't know whether it would happen here either, to be honest. I cannot answer that question because what I'm saying is for the, for the poor, you have Medicaid, Medicare, whatever you call it. So, so there is actually a system in place that covers them. I don't know whether there are situations where they would say, you can't get liver transplant, you can't get this because it's too expensive. If that was the case, then yeah, I have heard my answer to that. You want to change that system, but until you do that for these individuals at that point in time where they need to act, it might still be the least evil. Thank you. Thank you. So they consider their life not worth living because they are for good in prison. Yeah, either because they realize they're in prison for life or it's just not a good quality life or something like that. Or then even if they did find out they had cancer too, does that even change it? Uh, no, no, you have cancer too, they're not enjoying the prison life? Well, like, does no, 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 it's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. No, I'm, I'm facetious. wondering, yeah, what are the necessary factors? <laughs> You know what, I never thought of that. That's a really nice one. I will take this back to my people. Um, <laughs> tell you what, tell you what. Um, one, and, and I, I'm troubled about this because I realize I'm just looking for something to get out of this problem, right? Um, but a possible answer would be, of course, I just simply say, these people are in a strictly hierarchical environment, and arguably that sort of choice is not an autonomous choice any longer. It's very problematic because what you're really saying that these people in prisons can't even make those sorts of choices anymore. Um, I'm not sure, Rick, is there a situation in Canada where anybody could be like in prison for the rest of their life at all? No, they all get out at one point. You could. You could. Okay, so, so then... It's only a problem for America. No, no, no. It's in, no, also Canada, it seems. Um, it could also, be denied parole repeatedly. Um, so you might serve your 25 to life, but... Paul Bernardo, for instance, who murdered several women, um, he, would get out, he would never get out because they would just think he's just too dangerous. So he would come up for parole and they'd say, no, we are too much of a risk. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because they could really say that their life would not be worth living for. Here, no, here, you know what the, the advantage is? The advantage, I think the answer to that would be that probably, well, who knows? Um, my hope would be that they would not find a doctor willing to assist them because there is no it's not it's, it's not any longer there is no clinical problem. Somebody is just irritated about the punishment. Um, having said that, I mean if it's an autonomous choice, I, I really don't know. Yeah, I am lost. I hope cut it off. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm not sure what the answer to that one should be. It's fascinating actually because I think it's a very good question to ask. Um, if I if I could, and I, I'm not sure that this is accurate, but my thinking on this is that if you're serving a sentence, if you're serving the conditions of the sentence, yeah, and, right. <laughs> and if you're serving for life, then it's no longer your decision, it's now the government's decision. Um, those on death row who are waiting to be executed do not have a right to commit suicide. So because their sentence is to die. And I'm, as, as ridiculous as that may sound, you're under, you're under the authority of the state who has made a judgment, yeah. and the judgment has to be carried out. And so you have lost your autonomy by the sentence that the state has imposed. And I'm only discussing this from a from a, a, a legal philosophy. Not it makes perfect sense. It yeah. This makes perfect sense. You're right, because that's a condition of the punishment that, that you have received. You can argue whether the punishment is just, but, but that's a separate issue. Um, 
That's a dude, basically. And you had one on death row who says, I, I want to kill myself. I mean, the one in Oklahoma that just happened the other day, uh, he attempted to harm himself. He was uh, forbidden to harm himself. Uh, and then the state harmed him by a cocktail that did more. Uh, but, but the point yeah, no. was, he didn't have the autonomy to determine when he would die. It was the state who determined. Well, he had the autonomy, but he wasn't able to execute it. What's that? Yeah, he had the autonomy. He had the autonomy, but he was not able to enforce it, his choice. He could make an autonomous choice, but he wouldn't be denied. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's under the custodian. Oh, yeah. he's, he's, uh, it's under the custodianship of the state. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So individuals who want to die because they're sick of living, but there's nothing wrong with them, do you think that they should be forced to give up their organs to someone who wants to live but is on death row? Say that again. <laughs> Did you really say that? I'm just repeating it. Okay, so say somebody wants to live, but, um, or somebody doesn't want to live, and So the person does or does not want to live first? But yeah, they don't want to live, but there's nothing wrong with them. But they want to be, they want to be like, have assisted suicide. Do you think that they should give up their organs to somebody who does want to live? Yeah. I, personally, I think anybody who commits suicide, if they were halfway sane while they do that, should consider committing suicide in such a way that their organs can be used to preserve other people's lives. It makes perfectly sense to me. Whether you should force them to do that, that's a separate issue because you own your body and it's not clear where anybody should be able to just cut it open and take bits and pieces after you're dead. I wonder if um, the motivation behind it matters. Sorry. I'm thinking, imagine someone satisfies all the conditions and they're suffering and their illness is terminal, only they can tolerate the pain for the rest of their life, but they don't want to, quote, be a burden just something that you hear people don't want to be a burden to their loved ones at the end of their death. Um, we've only been talking about people who don't want to continue going on to the pain. Does that change anything at all? Or? I have to be honest, if they, if they meet the conditions, there's no point speculating about the motive. Because what are you going to do? Put them in a lie detector to find out whether they gave you a truth? Because the moment that you say this intention is unacceptable, then people will not have that intention. So it serves no purpose to, to speculate about that. What you surely what you could do is you want to ensure that no pressure is put upon them. Because we know that I mean there's certainly lots of reports from Japan that has become a problem that elderly people do commit suicide because they don't want to be a burden on their families. I don't know what whether that's true, but if it was true, um, you would not be able to stop this. You might want to look at the conditions that lead them to do that sort of thing. But in this particular instance, it's just dying. I cannot see that you would ever find out, you know, what people's motives are. That would not, I don't think it's proof to speculate on that at all. Yeah. If you're competent, it's your life, it's your call. As long as you do it, there's no coercion. That's what you want to be concerned about. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, I have two questions. I was wondering, is there a specific age where this would be okay for you? I'm more than sure if I've heard a specific age for it. Uh -huh. um, for me personally, um, I don't, I would not put an age on it. What I would put on it is the capacity to demonstrate that you understand your reasons. In other words, if you have a particular illness, that you understand what this illness means for you now and how it will develop, like, like what's going to happen basically to you, um, that you understand what it means to be dead, um, that it's irreversible, for instance, and that you express this view consistently over a longer period of time, that it's not just because you will find with the children, they go forth and back. They know that from the from bedroom where this is possible. So you would want to ensure that this is a stable, considered choice. I don't think then that age is important. The competency assessment, it can be professionally done. That's what is important. That would be my view. In our document, adults only competent, full stop. Okay, thank you. Now, you have two questions. 
I'm, yeah, the, old, I, I'm the old guy, you see. Put your hands there, your hands there. Okay. Right. Because I was thinking that if there uh -huh. if there wasn't um if there was an age limit that you know you can look at an eighteen year old and they can have a lot of wisdom, but you can look at a twenty five year old and they can still be within a sixteen year old or a younger child's uh, mind frame. Yes. So I was wondering if there was an age limit put on that because you have to kind of take that into consideration as well. Yeah. So so yeah, as I said in Belgium, this is how they approach this. In, uh, in our report, we simply say you have to be legally competent, and that, is, that excludes children, except mature minors, which is a dicey, a dicey case. I don't know exactly how this legally pans out in Canada, but yeah. So. Just two questions of clarification. Early on in your presentation, you were talking about uh, the lack of availability of palliative care in Canada. Were you implying that that was a rationale for assisted suicide? And, and then the other question I have is, I, did I hear that if some, in, in your thought that someone who was, say, diagnosed as clinically depressed, that that would be, that, that, would, dis, that would not disqualify them from uh, receiving or from accessing assisted suicide? All right, so, so the, um it, the depression, um, being clinically depressed would not, as far as our report is concerned, would not exclude you because uh, it is a matter of competency assessment. That's on a case by case basis. Um, and that's a matter for a psychiatrist that is ultimately not involved in the care of the patient, like an independent person, to, to evaluate that, that patient and decide whether that patient is able to make an autonomous choice or not. And, and, and this, is, this is where the line would be drawn. You cannot say you have depressions, therefore you're only competent. I mean, even today that's not happening. These people can vote, these people can hold jobs. Um, so so you know, that, that would be really problematic. You cannot just declare people with a label as incompetent. That would be really problematic. Um, the, I hope I, I remember now the, um, the question you had about palliative, palliative care in Canada. Um, I still don't understand what your, what your question was, though. You started by saying that palliative care was, was not easily accessible in all parts of Canada. And I wasn't sure if you were implying by that 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 was a, for, a rationale or a form of arguing for assisted suicide. That because people can't access palliative care as much as they would like, that they should have this other alternative. To be frank with you, that would be my view. Um, this is not a view that we have expressed in the report because we didn't discuss it. Because this report that we produced was way got, went way beyond the, the palliative care. We made a whole set of recommendations how that can be improved in the country. Except in public debate, we were stuck with the euthanasia stuff. But but there's way more in there. It's called it was really called it was really a report on end of life decision making in Canada and it covered a whole range of other issues. Um, the the problem, and this is not too similar to the where's this case that this question that you had, um, is, is, I think is actually very similar because it, it goes like this, right? If the provision of assisted dying would lead to deterioration of the quality of palliative care in the country, that would be a serious problem and it would be a reason not to have it. We know from the jurisdictions that have decriminalized that it has not had that consequence anywhere. In Quebec, for instance, the legislation has provisions about a whole range of improvements to palliative care. There's whole new resources going in there because people are concerned about that. Um, having said that, from a patient perspective, if you can't access palliative care that you consider makes your life worth living again, of course there will be some people at least who will make the decision based on that evaluation to ask for assisted dying. I have no doubt about that. You can show that the better palliative care is, the fewer people will ask for it. But again, there will always be some people that ask for it, regardless of what it is. Because for instance, they don't want to be switched off. They want to be cogent and there until the moment of their death. And, and this that means it will accelerate. They prefer to accelerate their death. So, yeah. Um, I'm actually and would one day, you know, be in a state of mind that they wanted to be euthanized, and the next day would forget about it and didn't really have anybody that could assist them in this. How do you think that 
Yeah, yeah. Remember the, the this criterion that, that you had for the in, in a way they did for the children in Belgium, and, and actually for anybody in any jurisdiction. It has to be a wish that is stable over time. Um, in Belgium, for instance, if the attending specialists realize that the kid is going forward and back one day he or she wants it, the next day she says, no, I'm quite good, actually, I want to stick around for a while longer. That would never happen. And I think the same would apply here, too. Um, the reality is with Alzheimer's patients, they would probably do it at a time when they're really lucid, because by the time they don't lucid anymore, they don't lucid anymore. They wouldn't ask for it. Which is a totally different question, by the way, because the question is, if they're really not lucid anymore, why would anybody want to terminate their lives? I would not see any good reason to do that. Because if they can live a life that is livable, you know, there's no suffering, there's no pain basically, there's no suffering, and all they do is they don't remember anymore who they are and what they're doing, but basically there's nothing bad happening to them. So why would you want to euthanize such a person? It serves really no purpose to my mind. It's really about quality of life. But it could well be that somebody who knows their Alzheimer's should be entitled to make that choice while they're lucid because they do not want themselves to come into that situation. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, do the people that come in requesting uh, assisted suicide, do they have to notify anyone? Like, for, like their like, family or friend or anyone? No. No. I, I mean, I have to be careful. I don't know if it's true for all jurisdictions. In Canada, that would not be the case. Um, the other concern is, 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 is very straightforward. Are they competent? Do they understand what the consequences of the action are? Are they volunteering? Is it their choice? And there's no obligation on them to justify it literally to anybody other than attending clinicians and specialists and nobody else. I feel like um, like the place should like I'm not have to, but like almost reach out and maybe like with some support they can like just change their mind. Well, they, they might do that, but this is the point. It's their life. It's their choice. Yeah. It's not for me to say, um, you must talk, I don't know, to your brother, your mother, the local priest, or a friend of mine. Or, you know, it could be like lots of people that <laughs> might be able to change their minds. And the reason for that is that these people are in such a distressed state to begin with, it doesn't make much sense to make the situation even worse for them. Just on the odd chance that they might change their mind because you just, you know, make matters worse, probably. Having said that, there could be situations where they might change their mind, but, but in reality, this, these cases do not happen in isolation. People don't just disappear. They don't just make these choices behind their loved ones because the whole point of having a sister dying is actually that they have their families there. It's not happening under the cover anymore. People have to be worried about whether they might be prosecuted if they sit next to the loved one while they're dying. So, so this mother was sitting, uh, I'm not sure whether she was sitting with her son, but there was, a, there was another um, um, case where, when an older man, a similar interview situation, but so he went there and they filmed him while he died and his wife was holding his hand. And of course she was devastated after it was, it was over and actually I was devastated, I cried just watching that. Um, but the idea that these sorts of things happen behind people's backs is not very realistic, I think. Just out of curiosity, is there a criteria for a pregnant female? Would she have to wait until the child was born if, it, if there's like a gray area? Uh, well, in Canada, it wouldn't be a gray area because in Canada, um, funny enough, true story, there's no legislation regulating abortion, so you can have it whenever you want. Period. As a result of that, and the, so as a result of that, there's nothing to be protected. You might disagree with that, but this is just the situation in that country. Um, so women can make that choice whenever they want, and because they can make that choice whenever they want, um, I mean, I find it problematic when you think about viability. Why would you not want to say at the point of viability, extract it first? But this is their choice in Canada. We can do that. Accordingly, that would not be an issue. And other jurisdictions might have very different views on that. Um, I, yeah, so I think I should leave it at that. Because it's another controversial topic. Do I want to get into this abortion issue? Not really. 
there any other questions? I, I have one last one. And, and I think it's a tricky one. Another one that people don't like to talk about in New York State, but very often it is argued that because there isn't a right to die, the new dignity law, uh, palliative care serves as a substitute for death with dignity, where the uh, parent, uh, where the patients or uh, and the parents or their significant others and the patient uh, want some active uh, intervention and none is available by the medical profession. Uh, it is argued by some, and doctors don't like to talk about it, that the palliative decision is uh, an alternative uh, to the ultimate demise of the patient, mm -hmm. knowing full well that palliative care of a certain kind and a certain quality of a certain kind ultimately leads to the death of the patient. Of so in, in essence, the argument is that we have a death with dignity solution de facto, not de jure, which puts the medical profession in a very precarious yes, situation. That's the point. And they put themselves in a very precarious situation because by administering palliative care, knowing what the end result is, with perhaps a part of uh, an intent or a knowledge at least that this would be the result, makes uh, doctors uh, complicit uh, to assisted suicide, which remains. Um, illegal in the state of New York. I, I pose that only as, um, as, as the arguments well, that exist within the state. Well, of course, I mean, we have assisted dying. It's a form of assisted dying. The way how it's rescued is, of course, the Aquinas, those who know Aquinas doctrine of the doubling, right? So, so the idea basically that, that is a Catholic saint. He came up with this, this fabulous idea that um, you are basically ethically the clear. <coughs> If you kill somebody but you don't mean to because you have another objective, in this case the objective might be to palliate the patient, so to, to basically make sure that they do not suffer anymore. But you foresee that you have to increase the dosage of the palliative medicine to such an extent that it will kill the patient. So you foresee it, but the kicker is of the doctrine of the double effect is that you do not intend for the death to occur. You only foresee it. I find that completely unintelligible, to be really clear. What I can tell you is what I can tell you is that doctors find it psychologically extremely useful. They find it legally extremely useful because they can always pretend they didn't mean to. The real problem that I see, I have no problem with that. Be unconsequentialist, I'm good with that. The only problem really is that the doctors can also not talk openly with the patient about providing this sort of service because then they will be legally liable because it's clear that what their real intention was. And that means, and we know this from Belgium for instance, because we have data, that in jurisdictions that criminalize assisted dying, people die who don't want to die because doctors or their family members believe this is what they would have wanted, but nobody dares to talk about it. It's a very, it's a very, I think it's a very serious problem that this is all happening under the cover. And we have these sorts of doctrines that help you make it look all good again. Um, it's hypocritical. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, please join me in thanking Dr. Gershman. <laughs> Thank you. So with, uh, very briefly, I'd like to remind you that there is a sign-up sheet at the front door in case you've enjoyed this talk.